In this episode, I'll talk about the adjustments that I make when it gets hot out. Hopefully, this will help you and your horse have a more enjoyable summer. And the concept of adjusting for weather could actually also apply to your winter challenges. So here we go. Episode 96, Summer Adjustments. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. Well, it is mid-June here in Florida, and it's starting to get hot. <laughs> it happens every year, though, so I, I do my best to not complain about how hot it is because, you know, big surprise, I live in Florida, <laughs> and it's summer. But anyway, it definitely requires a little shift of gears, a little shift of lifestyle, <laughs> and a shift with what I do with my horses. And one of the main things, as, as always, it's going to be about how you think about this challenge, how you, you know, how much you resist or just accept that it's hot out. So complaining about the weather is one of the most futile things that you can do. <laughs> and it rarely has anything positive that comes out of it. It just proves your brain that you're a complainer. And if you tell your brain you're a complainer, it's going to find more things for you to complain about. And there's not a darn thing that you can do about it. So not only do I do my best to not catch myself complaining about the heat, but I actually don't even look at the temperature. So I found out that whether it's cold weather or hot weather, if I see the number, it makes it worse. I'm hot already, but if I go look and then I go, oh my gosh, it's 99 with 100% humidity, suddenly I feel hotter. And the same was when it was cold. So first tip, <laughs> don't even look. And number two, don't complain about it. But this staying cool emotionally, you know, that that's an interesting phrase, right? Stay cool. <laughs> that's someone who's like you know, emotionally um, not bothered. They don't get all riled up, right? Stay cool. And I feel like staying cool emotionally does help me feel cooler uh, physically. Now, I actually looked that up and, and uh, I Googled a little bit to see if negative emotions made people feel hotter. And negative emotions will make people feel hotter. But then there were some positive emotions that also made feel, people feel warmer and would raise temperature. So, you know, there's no science behind it. But in my mind and my experience, that if I let myself get frustrated, um, I tend to heat up. So one of the things that I make sure that I do, I mean, I always make sure I always try to do this, but in the summer, I kind of extra put a little check on me because if I get myself all hot and bothered <laughs> and get my, let myself get frustrated or feel some negative emotions, it just feels like my head gets hot and then I'm even less comfortable than I was. So make a commitment to not fight it. Don't fight the heat. Don't complain about the heat. Don't look at the numbers. It just is what it is. And the main thing is we need to adjust. So that's what this podcast is about, is adjustments that I make for summer. So I thought I'd just kind of give some tips. This is not going to be a lecture on, you know, sports physiology in the summer. I'm not an expert in that. There's a lot of things that I say that um, you might want to go investigate further. Or they might not quite be, you know, right. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I do and why I do it. So, and this will be probably a little bit random. <laughs> but I, I just jotted down a whole bunch of things that I think about. And, and I think it'll be able to help you. 
So with my horses, one of the things um, that I extra make a point of doing in the summer is to really focus on understanding. Now, this is something I do all the time, but if I think about highlighting um, education or communication and understanding versus strength and stamina exercises or, you know, sessions that really focus on strength and stamina, those are two very different focuses. And yes, we're always trying to have clear communication and understanding, even when doing strength and stamina exercises, but you get what I mean. It's like if they understand a movement and then we might spend time um, doing it for longer or, you know, doing it more frequently and really like making them sit a little bit more and doing another canter pirouette, something that's in the strength stamina department. But in the summer, I'll start to shift away from that. And I think, okay, they've got what they've got. They might even lose a little strength and stamina in the summer, maybe, but I'm going to highlight understanding. So it's a time that I might sit back, kind of look at each horse and go, okay, what's a little piece that maybe has been, you know, good enough, but maybe I can make that good enough piece like super cool, super clear, super refined, super light, super motivated, something like that. So focusing on getting in and out of the movement, you know, if it's a ridden kind of dressage movement kind of exercise. I might really refine the things around it, but um, not spend so much time doing it. So for ex to give an example, I mentioned canter pirouette. So there might be a time when I'm practicing going down the line, cantering in place, turning it around, seeing if I get a certain number of strides, you know, seeing if I can go a few times around in a schooling pirouette and, and work on things. So real strength and stamina. But in the summertime, I might not do so much of that, but I might do more walk, canter, canter walks or, um, you know, walk pirouettes and then adding canter transitions to them and playing with it a little bit like that, where I'm looking for more nuance, more refinement, maybe thinking about myself a little more. How can I use more minimal aids? How can I do it lighter? And I'm not actually doing the canter pirouette, but I'm playing with all the things around the canter pirouette. I found that, um, I don't know, I feel like in the summer, fatigue just can set in quicker. I mean, I feel it with myself, right? That I think the body has to work a little harder to stay cool. And I find that, you know, I'll feel fatigued much sooner. And when you start feeling fatigued or when you start being fatigued, um, there's more chance of injury and also cognition goes down, right? You're, I don't know about anybody else, <laughs> but when I'm hot, like my brain isn't functioning as well as it can. So I'm really aware of that. Like I don't want to stress myself too much because I can't think. And if I can't think and I'm fatigued, I'm going to be sloppy. And that's when the injuries happen. And that's got to be the same for our horses too, Remember, our horses are doing most of the work and they're bigger bodies, you know, so that they're having the same stresses that we're having. Another thing that I think about in the summer is um, hydration and being aware of dehydration. Now, actually, hydration is another thing I'm kind of obsessed with <laughs> with my horses because uh, in the winter time too, when it's cold, I always worry that they're not drinking enough. And it's just so easy for a horse to get a little dehydrated, then they get a little dried up inside, then they get an impaction, and, you know, this whole spiral of events can, can go in the wrong direction simply from lack of hydration. So um, my horses all have automatic waterers in the stalls and the pastures, but I also put out um, tubs of, that I, of water that I change every day, and I put a little swig of apple cider vinegar in it. I find my horses really love the apple cider vinegar water. Now, people always ask me how much, uh, I don't know, if it's like a 20-gallon tub, I kind of maybe, maybe a quarter a cup or something like that. I just kind of go slug, <laughs> I glug, glug, glug of, of it. It doesn't take much, but it's rich in potassium 
and I think they like the taste of it, I found, um, and it causes them to drink a little bit more. So I also have a tub. One of those tubs is in my barn aisle on the way to the grooming stall. When I'm about to groom them to tack them up, I check and see if they want to drink. And then as soon as I come back from my ride, it's right there by the wash stall. So I untack my horse and they're free for a moment. I don't just stick them on the cross ties. They're free for a moment. My horses know to stay, basically stay in the box. Um, but they have an opportunity to go and drink. And so many of them really want to go right to that water. And I know how I feel when I'm thirsty and I want to drink right away. Uh, so I let them. I think there's these old wives tales when, when I was a kid first learning about horses, it's like, don't let them drink before you ride them and don't let them drink for a certain amount of time after you ride them. Gosh, I, you know, <laughs> when I exercise, I, that would be pretty cruel if someone was like, no, you can't have any water anywhere near your workout session. So look that up, correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, in my experience, uh, I have not seen any ill effect of horses drinking, uh, air temperature water <laughs> as much as they want. Uh, and I'll even, if I'm riding in a field and it has a water and I pass by a water and they tell me they want to drink, they can go have a drink. Remember horses are sweating over their whole body. So they're losing a lot of water. And the other thing to think about is that they're getting enough salt replaced. So um, my horses all get iodized salt in their food, and then um, you can check if they have enough um, access to more if they like. Now, this is a whole thing. If you start Googling salt blocks <laughs> and what kind of salt horses should have, and it's kind of a rabbit hole. So I'm not going to say one thing or another about all that, uh, but I don't have salt blocks for my horses. I just give them iodized salt in their food and um, they get some, also some free choice access to that if they would like. Uh, so that's my, that's my talk about that. So back to, I'm just looking at my, my list of notes here and they really are fairly random. So excuse me if it sounds like I'm jumping around a little bit because I am. All right. Uh, so back on, on the subject of the actual training session with dressage, it's so easy to kind of get going around and around and around and around and around and around on those endless circles, just trying to get that bend just a little bit better. I know the next time around is going to do it. Let's try those transitions again. Um, but I have to make a, you know, a promise to myself of like, all right, I don't want to just go around and around and around. So I want to be thinking about, um, you know, it's going to take a little more pre-planning. So I'm like, well, what am I really trying to do? And who, what horse needs what, what's the sort of weekly arc? I, I like to think in weekly arcs. And how can I accomplish that in as few footfalls as possible? So one of the things that I do when I'm planning my rides is kind of think about, all right, who needs the arena? All right, so there's some horses I'm working on things that I really would like the arena. I'd like a square. I'd like the nice dirt. I'd like the mirrors or the fence. Whatever the purpose for using that tool of the arena, there's some horses that I'm like, okay, I really want would like to use the arena for X, Y, Z reason, and how many days do I think I'm going to need to do that? So I kind of have a sense of that for each horse. And then my, my arenas are not totally in the shade. So the arenas, whoever needs the arenas, they get ridden first. So the first horse of the day might be, you know, it might look like ovation gets the arena, the first spot the first day, then on Tuesday, Solana gets it. And then on Wednesday, Natia gets it. And then on Thursday and Friday, whichever two of those three horses needs a repeat, then they get the arena spot. So my first spot is the arena spot because the arena only is going to, it's one of the first places that gets in the sun. And then I think about um, some other shady areas I have. So I have another shady area 
that's right on a fence line and it's a really long fence line and it's got a, the whole thing is in shade and in that second horse spot that shady spot goes for probably like 20 or 30 meters away from the fence so it's kind of like a really long <laughs> uh, really long open on one side arena so there's a fence on one side and then it's open to the rest of the field so there might be a horse that kind of needs arena stuff, but maybe um, the mirrors or the fence isn't that important, but I still want a little structure. And then that horse can go second in the sort of semi-shaded area. I also have a um, bunch of trees that are planted in a row. Uh, the people who had my property before me planted a whole bunch of pecan trees. I think they were trying to like make pecans. <laughs> so anyway, so these beautiful rows, which make almost like an arena like space, or at least it has some markers and boundaries and, um, it's easier to see straight lines. So that might be an alternate arena kind of area. So I'm just basically looking around the property going, what's the tool I need to help this horse. And then where's the coolest area I can do it. So then after that second spot, so, uh, you know, somewhere in the third hour of the morning, that shady area is getting skinnier and skinnier. But in my boys' field, all along the back of this this um, field, there's still a nice strip of shade, and there's a little bit of shade on this other side, and it's on a little bit of a hill, and the horses really like going out there. So that might be um, a spot for anybody who... Um, needs a little more motivating environment, or maybe I want to do a little bit of trotting laps or something like that. So it's a little bit stamina related, but it's a really fun environment. There's usually a nice breeze up there. Um, so I'll think about it that way. And then another op, two other options after that is next to my house, there's um, about six acres and we cut some trails through the woods. So it's all in the woods. And if there's a horse that just needs to do walk work um, or, you know, have go for a walk with me on the ground just to do something different and fun um, during the hotter part of the day, then I can go out on the trail and it's all shady and it really makes a difference and I'm not going to do much out there anyway. And then the last option is uh, for the horses who don't require movement at all. So the horses that I'm going to do some other sort of silly horse trick or horse health thing or some other whatever it might be um, that can do it in the barn with the fans on or standing under a tree, <laughs> you know, where I don't, I'm not necessarily going to ride or maybe it's in hand work or doing something small, something that doesn't cover a lot of ground and I can do in, in a pretty confined area wherever the temperature is the coolest. So these are all the sort of things I'm, I'm thinking of in my mind. And so through the arc of the week, um, if I'm playing with all these horses, at the end of the week, <clears throat> I've made decisions so that they're making improvements and they're getting enough variety and enough time touching on the important exercises that I want to do, but I'm not just putting them on the list and going out there and trying to do my February schedule and then suffering and complaining and getting overheated and grumpy and, uh, you know, <laughs> um, by fighting the reality that it's too hot to do it. Now, I realize also that I might be a little bit fortunate because I'm not training other people's horses. So I think this is this can be a big challenge for people who have horses in training and maybe you've got the same 10 horses in training and the owners are like expecting training. It might be really helpful to sit down with the owners because I, I think there's a third option other than um, keep the same training schedule, doing the same plan and fight and be miserable because it's hot out and it's two o'clock in the afternoon and you've got to like somehow make progress on the counter canner, <laughs> you know, or saying it's too hot. I'm going to take them out of training and then you lose all your income and the progress stops dead in its tracks. So I think there's a third choice there, 
which is to think about exactly what I'm talking about and talk to the owner about what's the best for the health and the training of the horse. So I've gone through lots of Florida summers now, and I always come out the other side feeling like I've progressed. So a lot of times the only measure of progress is can we go all the way through the test? Can we do all the movements in a row? Are we, you know, are we ready to compete and get that 80% or something like that? But sometimes the progress comes from taking a step back and going deeper and not just pushing forward. So, and I think this is part of what we can educate the owners, you know, an amateur or novice horse owners and say, okay, we're going to do these different things. Here's all these other parts that are important to the health and the welfare and the education of your horse. And yay, it's hot out. So now we get a chance to do this because maybe what's going to get you your 80% at the show is taking time to work on the trailer loading in the heat of the summer instead of drilling the test. Because maybe if your horse arrives to the show not stressed out from the trailer and is calmer and maybe not stressed out from clipping or maybe not stressed out from all the scary objects or the things that you've kind of been dealing with but you haven't really taken the time to resolve because you're so busy training, like those actually could reflect in the scores if, if scoring and those kind of goals are important to the owner of the horse, like those have a direct relationship. So a lot of times we don't see it like that though. Um, so if you've got to think about it, I'm speaking to the professionals now, you've got to think about it and see all the things that we need to do, educate the trainer, the owner of the horse and get excited about this. And, and if you feel like the person needs to learn more well then there's I'm sure there's theory I'm sure there's things that the rider can practice I'm sure there's like body stuff with their own position other things that they could do maybe cross training and doing some Pilates and you know what can you do more holistically to achieve the goal so I'm talking to professionals now to talk to their clients but maybe you're the client (laughs) So maybe you're the horse owner or the person with the horse in training or a person taking lessons and you're like, hey, I still want to take my lessons, but I think everybody is going to be happier. You, the instructor and the horse, if you just go, you know what? I think it's kind of crazy to go around and around and around and have a 45 minute lesson in the blazing sun. Why don't we take these pieces and make a list of some things that we can refine and we can pluck apart and we can work on separately. Oh, that turned into a bit of a rant. (laughs) I guess the point is there are options and we need to think about it and not fight it. Another favorite thing of mine to do is work is walk work. The walk is the most powerful gate. It's the gate where you can educate with the least wear and tear. If you improve the walk, so many other things improve. There are so many things you can refine. It's hard to improve a walk. So if you can improve a walk, you have just mastered some skills. And those skills will definitely show up in the other gates. Sometimes it's okay to give a horse time off. If they've been working hard all season, do a planned rest time at whatever is going to be the hottest part of the summer. Do it now on purpose so you don't have to do it later because of an injury. That's what I always think. I was like, okay, I'm going to give you the time off now when I don't need to because the universe somehow plans these days, these times off for horses. (laughs) So I always feel like, let me do it when it's my idea in the summer instead of doing it when it's the universe's practical joke idea right when things are going really well and I'm all excited to ride and the weather's perfect. Another thing I like to have handy and around the property is fans with misting systems. It's pretty easy to set up. You can buy them at like the Home Depot or, you know, Lowe's or whatever. You can order them online. Just little, little tubing and they have little misting heads. 
and you stick them on front of a fan that can make such a difference to the horses. So we have them in the barn and we have them in each pasture. I have a little, little like roof <laughs> thing. And then we stick the fans underneath the roof and we stick the, uh, misters on it and the horses love them. We really need to help them stay cool. So make sure that they have shelter and make sure that they have a way to cool themselves. Um, bring, you know, whether that's inside or outside, I've had to bring some horses in, um, watch them for, um, anhydrosis. If they stop sweating, that can be really, really dangerous. It's a really big health risk and something here in Florida we have to watch out for. Um, I think this is my personal opinion. I think stressing a horse in the heat can create anhydrosis. I've also seen it with retired horses that are older, but it can happen to any horse. So be really on the lookout for any kind of change in their sweating um, patterns. It's usually one of the first signs is the sweat patterns will show up strangely. They're not sweating where they should, or they are sweating in like a funny spot. And there's things you can do. So there's a supplement called 1AC and I found acupuncture. And I'm sure if you do a little investigation and um, there's lots of things that people have seen work, but those, those are my reliable. Number one, I check that the horse is not stressed. I check that they're getting enough to drink. I'm checking that they have a place to cool down during the day. And then I do 1AC and I get the acupuncturist out. All right, back to the riding. I told you my notes were kind of random here. <laughs> I just did a little brain dump about this. Another thing I think about in the riding session is I, I look at my warm-up strategies. So usually with each horse, I'm always trying to find the most efficient warm-up. But in the nice weather, we have a little bit of a luxury of giving them some time to warm up and trying different things. So in the summer, I try to find some shortcuts. And I know shortcut is kind of a dirty word and with horses because there are no shortcuts. But you know what? Sometimes there are. Sometimes we get in a, a pattern of doing something a certain way, be, usually because it works. But then we keep doing it and we need to test. I think this is always good. But in the heat, even more important is I wonder how little I could do and then get ready, then still arrive at this whatever, um, criteria that I'd like to have my horse do. So instead of 20 minutes of stretching before they collect, I wonder if I can just start the collection sooner, maybe just at the walk, or I wonder if I cut out the trot, what if I do the canter first? So that's something just gymnastically, if you improve the canter, it usually improves the trot. So one really efficient strategy is warm up at the walk enough that you can go right to the canter work and then check on the trot after that. That's sort of the, the quickest way to get the whole horse, get all three gates, is do the walk, then the canter, and then the trot's often a, a, a freer, <laughs> freer ride. So go ahead and allow yourself to try some quote-unquote shortcuts. Think of them as efficiencies. Maybe you can save yourself a few steps. And just doing it with the awareness of, hey, I'm going to see if this can work. Knowing that if your horse is like, lady, you're crazy. I'm not ready for that. What the heck? <laughs> you're going to go, okay, sorry, just checking. <laughs> and then you figure out what is the piece that they need to be able to arrive at that sooner. I think a lot of times you might be surprised. So again, do it with that curiosity. I have a friend who... Um, had a big horse that was a non-sweater. So he had anhydrosis and she couldn't get it to turn around. It's just, that's the way he was, but she lives here in Florida and would ride him in the summertime and would ride him all year round. But for her with a, with a non-sweating horse, then kind of every day of the year is like summer. So she had to think, about how she rode that horse every day of the year, the way I'm talking about for this podcast. Because he, if he started to get warm, he couldn't sweat. So she had a clear threshold that she just could not go over with him. But she trained him to Grand Prix and he even competed at Grand Prix. 
And it was so interesting to watch her and to see what she could do. And it was a matter of not trying to do everything in the same day, but picking the most efficient warm up for her and for him. And then what's the piece today? What's the piece today? And that there was always a cutoff and that she simply could not go beyond that cutoff, which often like 20 minutes or something like that. But he did it. So when it's hot, you'll have to think a little bit more. You'll have to plan each ride, but it's worth it. It's so easy to get stuck in our own patterns, but just because the pattern works doesn't mean there might not be an even better pattern to be discovered. So the summer heat requires us to rethink what we're doing, find efficiencies, be more refined, and to stop the mindless, useless movement of riding around in so many circles. And thinking like this is always going to give you better results. And like with so many things with horses, the key is the attitude that you have. If you let yourself get frustrated or just try to push through the pain and the discomfort of being overheated, you and your horse are just going to get hotter and more frustrated, possibly sick and injured. So when it gets hot, let cooler heads prevail. And then get curious about what you can do and just do that.